Welcome to the Physics Classroom's video tutorial on circular and satellite motion. The topic of this video is velocity and acceleration for objects moving in circles. And we want to know, what is the direction of the velocity and acceleration vectors for objects moving along circular paths, and how do you calculate the magnitude of the velocity and the acceleration for objects moving in circles? I'm Mr. H. Let's get started. The concepts of speed, velocity, and acceleration are typically introduced in a kinematics unit of a physics course. In order to understand the movement of objects in circles, we must first understand these three important kinematic concepts. So let's do a quick review. Speed refers to how fast an object is moving. It's a scalar quantity, meaning it's described by a magnitude, but you'll never find a direction associated with it. Velocity refers to the rate at which an object changes its position. Unlike speed, velocity is a vector quantity and because it is, it has a direction associated with it. At any given instant in time, the velocity of an object is the speed value plus the direction the object is moving. Acceleration is the rate at which an object changes its velocity. Like velocity, acceleration is a vector quantity. It has a direction associated with it. We often distinguish between two different categories of circular motion. First, there's uniform circular motion. That's when an object moves in a circle at a constant speed. In using the term uniform here, we mean constant, steady, or unchanging. In non-uniform circular motion, an object moves in a circle or along a curved path with a changing speed. A classic example of uniform circular motion occurs if I were to take a lab stopper, tied a string to it, and whirled it in a horizontal circle. What we would notice is that at every given point along the perimeter of that circle, the speed of that stopper would likely be the same value. We'd have non-uniform circular motion if we took the same lab stopper with a string tied to it and whirled it in a vertical circle. In a, such an instant as this, we would notice that the speed of the object would tend to be greater at the bottom of the circle than it is at the top of the circle due to gravity's influence. As mentioned earlier, velocity is a vector that has a magnitude in a direction. For objects moving in circles, or at least along curved paths, the direction of the velocity vector is in a direction of a line that is drawn tangent to the circle at any given location along the perimeter of the circle. This is a top view of a car moving in a circle at a constant speed. It's uniform circular motion. The blue arrows represent the velocity vectors. Their length represents the magnitude of the velocity, and their direction is the direction of the velocity vector. You'll notice two things. First, the direction of each arrow is tangent to the circle. That is, it touches the circle at one location only. Second thing you'll notice is that the size or magnitude of the velocity vector is constant because it's uniform circular motion. This is a side view of a bucket of water tied by a rope and whirled in a vertical circle. You'll notice two things about the blue velocity vectors. First, they're tangent to the circle at all four locations shown. And second, their size varies over the course of the circle. For instance, it's a shorter arrow at the top of the circle and a longer arrow at the bottom of the circle. That indicates a slower speed at the top, a faster speed at the bottom. This diagram represents a car moving along a curved path. It's not actually a circle, but a collection of circles joined together. You'll notice that the blue velocity vectors are tangent to the circle at every location that is shown. I've been emphasizing that velocity is a vector that has a magnitude in a direction. How do you calculate the magnitude of the velocity vector? Well, first, you have to understand that any given instant in time, the magnitude of the velocity is simply the speed of the object. In other words, the velocity is the speedometer reading plus the direction the object moves. On average, the speed of an object is the distance traveled per time of travel. In other words, it's the distance per time ratio. Oftentimes, we happen to know the radius of the circle and the time to go around once, which we call the period. In such situations, to find the speed, you need a distance to go around once and the time to go around once. In other words, you take the circumference, 2 times pi times the radius r, and divide it by the period t, where the period is the time to go around once. 
Oftentimes, we know the number of revolutions an object makes per second. For instance, it might be that lab stopper making five revolutions per second. To calculate the speed, we would have to calculate the distance per time ratio. So if it makes five revolutions in one second, then it would have a distance of five circumferences and a time of one second. So we would go five times two times pi times radius r divided by one second. In kinematics, accelerating objects are changing their velocity, and at any given instant in time, the velocity is simply the speed with a direction. So an object that is changing either its speed or its direction is accelerating. That is, objects that are speeding up, slowing down, or turning are accelerating. For an object that moves in a circle at a constant speed, it is accelerating, not because it's speeding up or slowing down, but because it's turning. You can be guaranteed that any object that is moving in a circle or along the curved path is accelerating, even if its speed is held constant. Acceleration as a quantity is the rate at which the velocity changes. So let's consider two uniform circular motion situations. This one, case A, in which the object makes two revolutions per minute, with case B, in which the car makes 10 revolutions per minute. In which case is the acceleration the greatest? Well, it's whatever case the rate at which the velocity is changing is greatest. That is, the rate at which the turning takes place is greatest. And if you make 10 revolutions in a minute, that's a much higher rate of turning than if you made 2 revolutions per minute. Acceleration is a vector, and it has a direction associated with it. And the direction of the acceleration is inwards or towards the center of the circle. Here is a top view of a car moving in a circle at a constant speed. And the green arrows are acceleration vectors. You'll notice that at all eight positions along the perimeter of the circle, those acceleration vectors are pointing towards the center. We often use the word centripetal to describe this inward acceleration. Centripetal means center-seeking. In other words, if the car was not accelerating, it would travel off tangent to the circle at any given location. But because of the acceleration, it begins to seek the center of the circle relative to that straight line tangent path. Now you might ask, why an inward acceleration? Well, that gets complicated, but I'm going to tackle the question anyway. So put on your seatbelt. Here we go. Here's a circle, and here is a car positioned at the 1 o'clock position of the circle, and a second car at the 2 o'clock position. And here's the velocity at the 1 o'clock position, and the velocity at the 2 o'clock position. Now the acceleration is calculated as the delta v per delta t, where the delta v is simply the final minus the initial velocity, which would be v2 minus v1. Or, if we don't like to subtract vectors, we could say v2 plus the opposite of v1. So let's give it a try. Here's vector v2, and I'm going to add to it the opposite of v1. There's the opposite of v1. And now the resultant of v2 plus negative v1 is this green vector here labeled delta v. The acceleration depends on delta v, so it's in the same direction as delta v, and there I've shown it on the car. Now the average acceleration is, is experienced at the location of 130 on the circle. So I'm going to take the car with its acceleration vector and put it on the circle. There you see it. Where does the green arrow point? Towards the center of the circle. That makes you want to believe that the acceleration is inward. Not everybody can follow or believe the mathematical proof just given. So here's more evidence. It makes use of a quark accelerometer. A quark accelerometer can indicate the direction of an accelerating object. The quark accelerometer consists of a quark tied by a string to the lid of a water-filled jar that's turned upside down. On a per milliliter basis, the quark is less massive than the surrounding water and as such resists acceleration less than the surrounding water and will always lean in the direction of the acceleration. 
Here we see a side view of two cork accelerometers secured to the end of a short 2x4. That 2x4 is clamped to a rotating platform. When that rotating platform is spun in a circle, the corks will lean in the direction of the acceleration. As we watch this video of the rotating platform, we notice the direction the corks are leaning towards the center of the circle providing more evidence for the claim that objects moving in circles experience an inward acceleration. So one of the biggest take-homes from this lesson is that for objects moving in circles or along curved paths, the velocity is tangent to the circle and the acceleration is inward. Here we see the case of uniform circular motion. The blue arrows represent the velocity vectors and you'll notice they're tangent at all locations and the green arrow represents the acceleration vector which is directed inwards towards the center of the circle. These two vectors are perpendicular to one another for objects in uniform circles. Circular motion. For the non-uniform circular motion case, we still have the velocity vector, the blue arrow, directed tangent to the circle, and there's a component of acceleration that is directed inwards at each location along the perimeter of the circle. To be complete about this situation, there's also a component of acceleration in the non-uniform circular motion case that is directed tangent to the circle. As the object travels from the bottom of the circle where it's fastest to the top of the circle where it's slowest, there's a component of acceleration that goes against the velocity. And as that object moves from the top of the circle to the bottom of the circle and is speeding up, there's a component of acceleration in the direction of the velocity. But the focus here in this video is on the inward component of acceleration for objects moving in circles. For objects moving in a circle at a constant speed, the acceleration A of the object is dependent upon the speed V of the object and the radius of the circle R. The equation is A equal V squared over R. As the equation indicates, the acceleration is directly proportional to the square of the speed. So if the speed is doubled, the acceleration is quadrupled. And the equation also shows that the acceleration is inverse proportional to the radius of the circle. So if the radius is doubled with no change to the speed, it would cause the acceleration to be one half of the original value. It's at this time in every video that I like to help you out with an action plan, a series of next steps for making the learning stick. But before I help you out, could you help me out by giving me a like, subscribing to the channel, or leaving a question or comment in the comments section below. Now for your action plan. Here are four resources that you'll find on our website. I've left links to each in the description section of this video. There's a concept builder and a minds on physics mission great conceptual exercises. And there's a calculator pad to help you with some of the mathematics. And if you need to read and freshen up on some of the ideas, there's a written tutorial page on our website. Whatever you do, I wish you the best of luck. I'm Mr. H, and I thank you for watching.